Gabriel Okara was a Nigerian writer, born in the 1920s. He died in 1999. And much of his work explores the contrast between Nigerian and Western culture. I'll share with you a reading of Once Upon a Time in just a second. But when you listen to it, think about this context. Think about Okara's interest in Nigerian culture and whether you think that he feels a sense of loss, whether he feels perhaps that the African identity has been swallowed up through um, its immersion in Western values. Once upon a time, son, they used to laugh with their hearts and laugh with their eyes, but now they only laugh with their teeth while their ice block cold eyes search behind my shadow. There was a time indeed they used to shake hands with their hearts, but that's gone, son. Now they shake hands without hearts, while their left hands search my empty pockets. Feel at home, come again, they say. And when I come again and feel at home once, twice, there will be no thrice, for then I find doors shut on me. So I have learned many things, son. I have learned to wear many faces, like dresses, home face, office face, street face, post face, cocktail face, with all their conforming smiles like a fixed portrait smile. And I have learned too to laugh with only my teeth and shake hands without my heart. I have also learned to say goodbye when I mean good riddance, to say glad to meet you without being glad, and to say it's been nice talking to you after being bored. But believe me, son, I want to be what I used to be when I was like you. I want to unlearn all these muting things. Most of all, I want to relearn how to laugh, for my laugh in the mirror shows only my teeth like a snake's bare fangs. So, show me, son, how to laugh. Show me how I used to laugh and smile once upon a time when I was like you. Once Upon a Time is written in the form of a dramatic monologue, so here one person addressing another person, which is obviously classic dramatic monologue style. In this case, it's a father talking to his son, actually asking his son to teach him how to be honest again, how not to be fake anymore. Because this is supposed to sound like somebody speaking, then it's fitting that the poem doesn't rhyme and there's no obvious rhythm either. So it sounds very natural, like spoken English. So Akar has used free verse to make the poem sound authentic, to make this sound like real speech. The tone of this poem is full of sorrow, in that Okara is lamenting the loss of his identity, really. He feels that he's become, like everybody else around him, fake. He feels a hypocrite and he wants to return to the innocence of his childhood and that's why he's asking his son to help him. So it's a bleak poem. It's one about loss and regret and it longs for a return to the past. So there's a nostalgia there as well, a nostalgia for a time when people were more honest and open and when they didn't hide their real selves. The poem begins with the phrase once upon a time which we associate with fairy tales. So already we see that this is a nostalgic poem that looks to the past. It also casts some doubt really doesn't it as to whether Okara's dream of living an authentic life again, of rediscovering self, himself, can never come true. Uh, fairy tales were never real, were they? And is he saying that we are so far removed from what we should be, we are so lost, that the notion of rediscovering ourselves is, is just a dream, it's a fairy tale. Certainly the opening of the poem isn't very hopeful in that respect. The first two stanzas are structured in the same way in that they begin with a description of the past, so they're written in the past tense, first three lines, and then they switch to the present tense 
obviously we also get a shift in tone from positive to very negative. Okara's juxtaposed past and present in this way so that we cannot fail to notice the stark contrast. So in the past, they used to laugh with their hearts and laugh with their eyes. Two important images there, hearts and eyes, which are repeated through the poem actually. So hearts connote honest, deeply felt emotion and the cliche has it that eyes are the windows to our souls. So through a person's eyes, we're able to see what they're really feeling. We, we can see inside them. So once upon a time, laughter was the expression of genuine happiness. But now they only laugh with their teeth while their ice block cold eyes search behind my shadow. Let's look at that image. Uh, teeth, first of all, in contrast to the eyes, which are classically windows to the soul, teeth are white, hard and expressionless, aren't they? They reveal nothing. So laughter now shows nothing about what a person might really be feeling. It's a mask. Certainly not sincere, because the eyes are doing something very different. They search behind my shadow, which... It's a sinister image. Shadows connote something sinister, don't they? Something shady going on, something dark. And Okara is suggesting that people laugh when they want something. That word search suggests they're looking for something. There's an ulterior motive. Laughter isn't any longer the expression of genuine feeling. It's a cover. It's a manipulative thing, ultimately. And the eyes, again, far from being windows to the soul, are part of the cover, part of the concealment, because they've become ice block cold. That series of three stressed syllables reinforces those harsh adjectives, and we get a chilling sense of people totally devoid of any kind of warmth. And the second stanza follows precisely the same pattern. So there was a time, indeed, they used to shake hands with their hearts, but that's gone, son. Notice the conversational son. Um, makes the poem feel very personal, doesn't it? We're listening in. So they used to shake hands with their hearts. That's a metaphorical expression of shaking hands in a way that used to mean something. It was an honest way of greeting another person once and it, there was a warmth suggested again by that important idea of the heart. That's what's gone and in the shift to the present, far from shaking hands with hearts, metaphorically people now shake hands with their left, while their left hands search my empty pockets. Again we've got this strong idea that people only really communicate with one another when they're after something. Communication is about getting what you can out of another person. Notice Okara refers to his empty pockets. Does that suggest perhaps that he's been exploited by these dishonest people who are always on the make? Certainly that's an interpretation, isn't it? That you could offer. The verb search is repeated from the first stanza, like the word hearts. Um, and that reinforces this idea that people aren't happy anymore with what they have. They're always looking for something better. It connotes greed and personal ambition over any sense of community. And ultimately, in a society like this, smiles, handshakes, any gestures are empty, meaningless. They're part of an act. Words don't mean anything either. Here we have the language of manners, really. Feel at home, come again. But in Okara's experience, the doors are shut on him. I find doors shut on me. Not literally, I wouldn't have thought, in a society where people aren't as honest and open as to do anything, quite so obvious. But on a metaphorical level, he feels shut out. He feels alienated from this community that he used to be part of. He feels he's lost his home. We have the word home mentioned 
in this stanza. Adding to this sense of alienation is Okara's use of the word they, they being other people, and that creates a distance between us and them, doesn't it? Also the word they suggests that they're all the same. It's describing um, a group of people as if they're one person almost. But he's not just criticising others in this poem. Okara is including himself in the attack. So he's learned that to get on in life, you have to be false. You have to wear many faces and uses a series of compound words to describe the different parts that we play in life, really. Home face, office face, street face, host face, cocktail face. These aren't necessarily evil faces, are they? He's not talking about evil, he's just talking about inauthenticity and how with age we lose our capacity to communicate in a direct and honest and open way. So we learn to conform with what society expects, changing our faces in the same way that we would change our clothes and we are no more authentic than a portrait hanging in a gallery. The repetition of face and smile through this stanza also creates a sibilance. Now sibilance in poetry always evokes sinister forces. With clear self-loathing, Okara puts himself in the same bracket as the people that he describes at the start of the poem. So he too now only laughs with his teeth and shakes hands without his heart. He too speaks a fake language and he says goodbye when he really means good riddance and glad to meet you when he knows he isn't glad. The word bored at the end of the line is emphasised because of its position at the end of the line and we get the impression that life is dull and boring because everybody's a conformist. Everybody is doing what's expected and nothing is real and Okara hates himself for being part of that. Notice the repetition of I in this stanza as if Okara is trying to rediscover himself. He's trying to get back to the real I and he says, believe me son, I do want to change. That's what this stanza is about. He um, talks about unlearning all those horrible lessons that have taken him away, away from himself and those muting things, lessons which have stopped him showing any real emotion, stopped him saying or doing anything honest. Most of all he says he wants to relearn how to laugh, which is very sad, the idea that his life is so joyless he's actually forgotten how to laugh properly. And then the stanza ends with a sinister image and again one that expresses his self-loathing. My laugh in the mirror shows only my teeth like a snake's bare fangs. That references back to the opening stanza and the idea of laughing without using your heart or your eyes, but only revealing your teeth in an essentially empty gesture. But it's worse now, isn't it? It's, it is more sinister for this comparison to the snake. Obviously the snake's a dangerous, poisonous creature and it's one which, through the Bible, we associate with treachery and betrayal. So Akara is suggesting here that he's betrayed his real self. And the exclamation at the end of the line shows his strength of feeling about this, his desperation. The final stanza of the poem is the shortest, which gives it an impact in itself. And Okara repeats the phrase, show me, show me. He's imploring his son to lead him towards an honest and authentic way of life, one that is free from social rules, which are so corrupting in Okara's view. That phrase, once upon a time, that begins the poem also concludes it, and it reminds us of the distance Okara has traveled from his boyhood when he was like his son, when he was a real, honest, open, and free human being. And the phrase casts some doubt as to whether Okara will ever be able to return there because 
it gives the impression, that phrase, doesn't it, that this is a bygone age. And maybe the idea of ever going back there is the stuff of fairy tales in the end. As I've already suggested, this poem can be read on two levels at least. On one level, it's about the inevitable loss of innocence that occurs when we grow up and the poet is regretting the fact that by learning how to conform, we lose our honesty, our ability to communicate in a direct and open way. And that, would, that message would apply across cultures, wouldn't it? But knowing what we do about Okara's interests as a poet and the context that he writes in, you can't help but see this poem as well as a comment on the westernization of Africa. The poet seems to be suggesting that by adopting Western ways, he's lost himself and there is an identity crisis being explored through this poem. Okara perhaps wanting to rediscover his authentic African identity. This is absolutely a first person poem. It's uh, Okara essentially trying to rediscover that person, to find his real voice again. There's an obvious link with Kipling's if in that he's talking to his son, but that's really as far as the similarity goes because what Okara do, is doing is humbly asking his son to save him, whereas of course Kipling is telling his son how to live his life. So Kipling has all of the answers in that poem, whereas Okara is searching for an answer and looking to find it in his son.